some reiterating reminding you of what we have already covered good to be here tonight bless you bless you time out but i'm back with a vengeance i've got more word than i have time discerning of spirits is a gift of revelation it's a gift that enables the believer to distinguish what spirit is in operation it's an ability to recognize identify and distinguish between various kinds of spirits in ephesians 6 and 12 paul to the church at ephesus he says we wrestle on our wrestling matches not against flesh and blood people are not your problem it's the spirit behind it if you notice a particular behavior that's negative and toxic deal with the spirit first god gives the believer this gift to enable them to handle what they are going to have to deal with. If you're not wrestling flesh and blood and you're wrestling spirits, you'll need some supernatural enablements to deal in that realm because you've got to be equipped to handle your enemy. The gift of discerning a spirit is given to the believer to lift the veil. Elijah had to pray for Gehazi so that God would open his eyes and he would see 
angels and chariots of fire on the mountain and not only the enemy to lift the veil. When you're dealing with people, people are very good at pretending. We are all actors on a stage and everybody is presenting their good side. That will be Apostle S. Boom to you. Call me Boom again, you're out. To lift the veil, that means you don't want any more pretending. You have to deal with the spirit that's driving the person. Yes, yes, to lift the veil. Number two, 1 Samuel 16 and 7. To see as God sees. To see below the surface. To have the vision that God has of people and events. To lift the veil, A. Eh? To see as God sees. You know, the book says man looks at the outward appearance. But God sees the heart, the motive, the intention, the why behind what they did. Number three, to protect us from deception. Because there's a lot of deceiving spirits as well as deceiving, deceitful, troublesome, cantankerous people out there. That will give you a lot of drama. And so God needs to protect you from the deception because there are many false prophets who have gone out into the world. And they use the force of soul power to make people believe that they were sent by God. You've got to know Shibboleth from Sibboleth. Number four, to enable us to diagnose people's problems. Because as a, as a minister, you know, you ask people what is it they want you to pray for. And they play ring a ring a rosy with you. They never tell you the truth. People lie to preachers all the time. They never tell you the truth. And, and when God reveals something to you about the situation, they have the nerve to lie there too. Say, no, 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 pastor, that's not, no, that's, I'm not dealing with that. No, no, you, you got it wrong this time. And then two weeks later down the road, they come back with embarrassment and egg on their face to ask for prayer about something that you had an anointing for two weeks ago. Let me tell you how this thing works. Where there's revelation, there is demonstration. At the point when that gift is in operation, the same gift that can discern what's going on, the same word of knowledge to know what's going on, it carries at that moment in time the same power to defeat and destroy that thing that has been diagnosed. But what people do is they don't come up to the altar for prayer. They're embarrassed about this. They don't want their neighbors to know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they pretend with you. Then when you're leaving the service now, they're running to your car, banging on your windshield or banging on your side window. They need prayer there. We don't do private practice here. This is not Obia. We do public stuff like Jesus. Publicly, we do stuff. And if you don't move when the Spirit is moving, you don't know. Somebody else might get in the water before you. But the point of the matter is, the anointing is available at specific points in time. This is not juju we're doing here. You can't conjure up this. It's either there or it's not. You're either anointed or you're not. You either had a revelation or you did not. And you've got to move when God is moving. You can't wait for the preacher to get home. Then you're busting a beeline to go to his house to get your little private sneaky prayer like Nicodemus. I'm tired of Nicodemus people. They waste your time and when you're drained, you just want to get home and sleep, peel off your wet clothes, that's when they come and they need their own private prayer and they want to tell you about their grandmother. We're not interested. You wasted our time. Go home. Deal with the thing that you wanted to keep. Keep it to yourself. To protect us from deception. Number four. To enable us to diagnose people's problems. Number five. To discern whether it's the demon spirit or the Holy Spirit or human spirit. Number six. To figure out if there are angelic hosts in the room. In John 1 and 47. Nathaniel came to Jesus and Jesus discerned an Israelite. In whom there was no guile. He was a guileless man. He had no ulterior motive. In Acts 27, Paul discerned an angel on a ship that gave him a message that the ship would be lost, but everybody would be saved. Only he saw it and he got future information. Now you've got to be careful when you have that kind of information and that kind of insight. You're not going to be believed. So learn to deal with that too, to fall out from that. People are going to call you the falsest of all false prophets. All right. In Philippi, Paul and Silas and some others with them in Acts 16, 16 to 18, this girl was making dramatic spiritual pronouncements by a fortune-telling spirit that told the truth. And uh, 
Paul was annoyed greatly after a while. He rebuked the spirit after discerning that this girl was not sent by God. And Satan was responding and reacting to his plan of keeping this girl in bondage being revealed and created quite a ruckus. That's another thing. When you discern a demonic presence or power, get ready for satanic reaction. The devil doesn't like to lose his people who he has in bondage. And many times when you're trying to free people from demonic powers, you hear the demon will tell you as a minister, I don't want to go. I'm married to her. She belongs to me. The family made arrangements with me. Why are you tormenting me before the time? This is my house. I'm not going. They have a sense of entitlement. They want to stay there and they react to being exposed. And that's what the gift is for, to expose the devil. You don't know what you're fighting if you don't have discerning of spirits. The people in Jesus' time were very disrespectful. They call him a wine-bibber. They call him a glutton. They call him Beelzebub. They call him friends of prostitutes. They call him that fellow. They call him a demon-possessed man. They call him a carpenter. They were deliberately minimizing who he really was so that they could despise and mistreat him. And when he asked his disciples, only one of them would speak up for him. Peter said, thou art the Christ. The, the eleven remained silent. Uh, they are silent because they hadn't made up their mind yet as to who he was. They were silent because they didn't want to answer the question publicly and identify with him. Don't be shocked. Uh, people are not going to want to be identified with you until you come in your season of glory. That's when a lot of people jump on board. Now, this gift can be exercised and you can literally begin to get your ducks lined up when you have a solid grasp of the scripture because the scripture is the basis for which you can judge and know whether this thing is of God or not. If something is contrary to scripture, somebody sent me a, a little clip of a man kissing a woman, got his tongue all down her throat in a service, in a church service, and he was claiming that he was delivering her from demons by sucking on her tongue. You know that man has a lost spirit on him. You don't need much discernment to know that. That kind of tongue kissing is for man and wife story not for some pastor in front there the whole congregation is watching as he's tongue kissing her that's a demon right there the pastor has one and the people are listening to him it won't be long before all of them have two or three you have to have a solid grasp of scripture so you can judge things based on scripture number two you have to be sensitive to the leading of the holy spirit not because god show you something it means that you must yap your gums and run your mouth a lot of times he shows you just so that you can have insight. He shows you just so that you can make the necessary preparation. Not every revelation is for everybody. Not because you have a revelation, it means you must tell the world. That's what I'm saying. See something doesn't mean say something, not in the kingdom. A foolish man tells all his heart, but a wise restrains himself. Even a fool when he keeps quiet looks like a wise man. So you've got to have a solid Bible base. You've got to be sensitive to leading of the Holy Spirit because discernment requires an initial dose of work. This is one of the gifts of the Spirit that requires an initial dose of human effort, meaning you have to learn from Scripture what is so that when you see what is not, you know how to figure it out. Yes, it's a good gift. Why? It protects the integrity of what God is doing. How? By discerning you know this is not God, or this is God, or this is just flesh. At one time, Peter went to a city and he perceived that the man, I think it was Simon, was in the gall of bitterness and in the bonds of iniquity. No demon, but he just had this, this we say the take-ups or the take-ups was very bitter. He was a bitter individual trying to join the church to bring his funk there, and Peter figured him out. So it's a good gift to protect the integrity of what God is doing. That's why Paul could say, come out of her, you demon, even though the demon told truth. And they were servants of the Most High God in Acts 16. They had come to show the way of salvation. But let's say, for instance, if Paul didn't rebuke her and he went his way, it would be easy for the girl's handlers to tell the people, we all have the same spirit. And Paul and Silas and the rest have left, but we are going to continue what they were doing. And through divination... She could tell them what was happening in their life and have them convinced that it was a work of God when indeed and in fact it was not. So the discernment of spirits 
the discerning of spirit, sorry, protects the integrity of what God is doing. And then you begin to focus and understand that when this gift is in operation, you don't only see demons. You see what God is doing as well. It's not just a gift to figure out demons. It's a gift to figure out devils, A, angels, B, Holy Spirit, C, human spirit, D. There are four realms of spirits. And then under the demonic spirit, you have all this pride, loss, yeah, 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 yeah. A whole host of stuff. So when you make it your focus, understand that you're dealing with four spirits and they come in variation. You don't only see demons. There are some people, all they see is demons. Other people, all they see is adultery. They always know who's sleeping with who. We're not interested. This is not a porn show. We're not interested in that mess. You can see good stuff too. The gift is there to show good stuff as well as to show the demonic world. Now, understand that when you begin to discern, you should make prayer your first response. Make prayer your first response. Pray about the thing that you perceive. Pray about the thing that you got revelation about. And then, understand God's redemptive plan. What is God doing? Why did he show me the thing that he showed me? And what is he doing? What does he want me to do with this information? Not every information means you must say, this is CNN. You're in the Situation Room with Wolf Blitzer. It's not all for some production. Sometimes God shows you a thing to reveal the condition that someone is in so that you could be of help to them. Not so that you can run your mouth and yap your gums and tell the world what you just got. All right, figure out God's redemptive plan. And then stay in community. Don't be a maverick and go out there all by your lonesome because others may be able to bring guidance and oversight and confirm what's happening to you because you're not the only one that is seeing in the realms of the spirit. That's one of the things that will take you down a notch or two when you sit on your high horse. Other people are seeing the same thing you saw. And sometimes they have more insight and they got more information, including what you saw. They saw what you saw and they saw 10 minutes more of information. You saw 2 minutes of information. They saw 12 minutes of information downloaded from heaven. So when you stay in community, others can bring guidance, A. Eh? They can bring oversight, make sure you don't run off or some, and become some false prophet. Or they can confirm what's happening in you and through you. You don't have to wait for no confirmation though. Some people wait 400 years. Alright, so stay in community. Not because you're gifted, it means you must become obnoxious. Some of the most obnoxious people I have met are gifted people. They have a nasty attitude, but they're very gifted. And I would prefer not to deal with them as gifted as they are because I am not going to subject myself to the indignity of being exposed to nasty attitude. I'm too old for that mess. When I was younger, I'd take it. I don't take it no more. If somebody is constantly nasty to me, I don't care how gifted they are. They could raise the dead. I am not interested. I don't want them around me. And I'm not going to make myself available to be around them. I'm gone. Keep your gift. And your nasty spirit. So stay in community. And uh, don't let fear rob you of launching out into exercising in this realm of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Most people are scared out of their wits because they have seen how others were mistreated. They have seen how others were treated. They have seen the kind of price that you pay. They have seen the kind of backlash that comes on you. They don't want to be called false prophet. And so instead of them allowing God to use them, they'd rather sit on the sideline and be a spectator. I'm just reiterating what we've already done. Here's a beautiful song. I'm going to come back again and remind you of some more stuff that we did before I give you tonight's teaching. Here we go. Rising higher. And so Turn the I'll be all that the Almighty has intended. 
for my life and ministry From this moment on I'm no longer called to be From this moment on I will flow In my prophetic destiny I'm rising higher Than I've ever gone before Paul writing to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he, he labels and names there in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, they are not nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. They are more than nine. I just thought I'd throw that out there because every time I hear teaching on the gifts of the Holy Spirit, I hear people saying they are nine gifts. That means they didn't read Romans. <clears throat> and that's a totally different subject. I don't want to start on that tonight. Suffice it to say, there are more than nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. What Paul mentions here is not an exhaustive list in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He was just touching on the subject for the sake of the brethren at Corinth. All right, so reading from verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant, lacking in knowledge. A spiritual gift is a supernatural enablement that is given to members of the body of Christ by the Spirit of God for the profitability of the work of the kingdom. All right. They are not natural talents. They are supernatural enablements, supernatural gifts 
supernatural abilities given to human beings. That term supernatural tells you what it is. It's nature. It's not from man. It's from God. All right. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I will not have you ignorant. He was talking to the brethren. You hear people say, well, everybody can have a gift from God. No. He's talking to the brethren. It means they're born again people. <clears throat> I would not have you ignorant, which is, which is Hosea 4 and 6 comes into play right there. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. They have a good, nice church, nice robe, fantastic preacher. Everybody's a doctor nowadays. And they're ignorant of matters pertaining to the spiritual realm and the Bible. That's why that woman was standing up there having the pastor sucking on her tongue. And they're not married together. And uh, people think that that's, that's just the way it is. That's why the other pastor have the men walking, throw themselves on the floor. He's walking on top of them because he's too holy to touch the ground while he's preaching. And they believe that junk. That's why the other pastor sent them out in the, in, the, in the yard to eat grass because the spirit showed him that the brethren should eat grass. That's why the other pastor told them that uh, they should uh, uh, take off their underwear and they're in the church and, and they're taking it off because he has a word from God. That kind of foolishness is just so shocking. I don't know where to start to address those issues. But it all comes from ignorance and from a minister or so-called minister who... Is a wolf in sheep clothing, and it's about time that we begin to know who is who in the house of God. There's too many con games going on, and the people have become meat for these butchers. I believe in feeding the sheep, but I also believe in barbecuing the wolves. We got too much of that. All right. <clears throat> you know that you were Gentiles carried away onto these dumb idols, even as you were led. Prior to meeting Christ, you're worshipping all kinds of idols and pouring libation and all kinds of ancestral spirits and the whole nine yards. You were led astray. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God can call Jesus a curse and that no man can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, pay attention. There are diversities. Diversities mean different kinds. There are different kinds of gifts but the same Spirit. No matter what the manifestation is, what the gift is, it is the Holy Spirit that is giving gifts to men and different people have different enablements, supernatural enablements. All right. Now, there are diversities of gifts, but it is the same Spirit. And there are diversities of administrations, but it is the same Lord, the Lord who is Jesus over the church. And there are diversities of operations, manifestations, but it is the same Spirit which worketh in all. Now, you have got to understand that. There are diversities of operations. It is the same spirit, but he is using people differently. I get people all the time telling me, you know, you don't plan things one year ahead. No, because the way God uses me is totally different from the man who plans things one year ahead. I'm not mad with him for planning things one year ahead. And he can't be condemning me because I go with the flow of the spirit. I have plans. But I give God room to in, in, intervene and to do what it is that he wants to do. Because these planned, planned, planned services, usually they're so tightly planned, they plan God out of the service. It's amazing these same people who can plan a service one year ahead of time, have Easter eggs and bunny stuff and all kinds of contrary stuff that has nothing to do with the scripture. They have taken Christmas, now they're hustling to take Easter with the, with the cooperation of the church. We are cooperating with the demonic world in trying to break what has been known to be a Christian tradition. I'm not going to get in a fight with that, but I thought I'd mention that in passing. And if you want to take me on, bring it. <clears throat> and there are differences of operations, but it's the same God which worketh in all. What does that mean? It means that God uses people differently. He uses people differently. Don't try to get your minister to be like the minister of the road. And don't be upset with the minister of the road if he's not being like you. I have a different calling from, from other ministers. My job, I have a deliverance ministry. So op obviously, the operations like discerning of spirits and the prophetic stuff and apostolic uh, energy will be in demonstration. The raising up of leaders, that's a part of the calling that is upon my life. To raise up leaders, quality leaders that will make impact in the kingdom of God. Other people can be pastors over a congregation for years and years and years. And after 20, 30 years in ministry, they have not raised up one leader. I cannot do that. I have to keep raising up leaders every three years 
There must be a new batch of quality people that can hold their own in any place and rebuke that devil and give him a run for his money. I cannot tolerate just being the one big dog in the church. I'm the only one who can bark. As soon as I start a church, which most of the churches that I've pastored, I have started them from scratch, preached them out from their life of sin, then I'll begin to find people, see who are gifted in whatever area, and work. And then my major focus is one, prayer, and two, giving them a, a firm grasp of scripture. So I don't have time for the entertainment, for the concert and all that other stuff. I do go to these things, but other people who are not called to do what I do, they can have their fun and do all of that stuff. But I am focused on what I'm doing. I'm not vexed with them for having fun and having a great time, but that's not what I'm called to do. And I'm focused on what I'm doing. People think I'm antisocial because I'm not out there every weekend doing something over here, over there. I don't have time for that. I do have time for that, but I don't have time for that. I've got to focus on what I'm called to do. If three years pass and I don't produce 10, 12 new leaders somewhere, I get depressed. Other people can have people dependent on them. I can't tolerate that at all. The first thing I try to do is get people to not depend on me. Don't call me for prayer. Pray for yourself. Pray for each other. Don't call me to explain scripture. You should know that by now. You know, I don't uh, raise up a church of people who are dependent on me for every single thing. I try to get them dependent on God quick and try to get them a firm grasp of the scripture. And so it's going to be sola scriptura, sola scriptura, sola scriptura, prayer, 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 sola scriptura. I'm trying to raise up leaders. I'm not trying to amass followers. I don't have time for that. I'm not interested in these games that people play. Who's the most popular pastor wrong? I am not interested. I'm not in that race. Go ahead and try to outrank and outdo. That's your business. Go ahead and do that. At the end of the day, 30 years from now, the people that pass through my ministry are going to still be around and they're going to still be doing great things to God. I wonder if you can say the same thing about the people that are following you. Having them dependent on you after 20 years, they still need you to figure out John 3.16. Come out of that cave. All right. There are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh in all. And the manifestation, the making known of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Profitability is key here. The gifts are not for self-aggrandizement, but for the profitability of the kingdom. It's always kingdom purpose. It's never about you. It's never about your organization. It's never about your denomination. Some people are so uh, uh, focused on their little denomination, they can't think kingdom. They can't think king. They're not allowed by their headquarters to think kingdom. They can only think within the confines and parameters of a particular denomination. And once their denominational ilk is uh, messed with, they pitch a fit like little brats. All right. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. That means a word to know what to do and how to act in a particular situation. To another, the word of knowledge. This means an ability to know in three realms, past, present, and future, with accurate knowledge what is going on, what happened, what's happening, what's going to happen. Three realms of knowledge by the Spirit of God. This is not voodoo. This is not psychic. This is God giving information. The Holy Spirit will show you things to come, A. The Holy Spirit will bring to your memory things you have learned, B. And God is a speaking God. Let them that have ears to hear, hear what, what the Spirit is saying unto the church. That's in the present tense. So present, past, and future. To another by the same Spirit. Faith by the same Spirit. Supernatural ability to believe God above and beyond the normal faith. Yes, to another, the gifts of healing. Healing of the body, healing of the mind. Th different kinds of healing by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. Suspension of normal laws to bring to pass something that will give glory to God. A miracle is a spectacular event. Healing of a headache is not a miracle, that's just a healing. We got to know the difference in these things. We are still running behind these little petty definitions on today like today. To another prophecy, insight, power to speak, and power to not only speak, but also to declare the word of God, and then to have an, uh, a bit of insight into future events, prophetic, declarative, declaring the word of God, and prophetic, insightful things that pertain to future events. All right. To another... Uh, prophecy to another discerning of spirits 
and to another diverse kinds of tongue, different kinds of languages that people can go to a particular culture and speak in the language of those people, even though they have never heard that language before. To another discerning of spirits, and that's where I'm making my focus. Discerning of spirits is not discernment. Every time I hear people talk about the gift of discerning of spirits, what they're talking about is discernment, and sometimes you pull them aside and try to enlighten them and they get angry, or some of them didn't even know there was a difference. There is a difference, y'all. Discernment is different from discerning of spirits. There's, there's two totally different animals we're talking about here. Lion and giraffe are not the same. Mule and donkey are not the same. Dog and chicken are not the same. How you can mix up a dog and a chicken, I don't know. Discernment is different from discerning of spirits. Discerning of spirits has to do with insight and knowledge into the realm of the spirit. You're dealing with spirits here. You're dealing with the spirit of man, that is the candle of the Lord. You're dealing with the Spirit of God, which is the Holy Spirit. You're dealing with angels who are ministering spirits sent to minister for us who are heirs of salvation. And you're dealing with the demonic world, which means Satan and all his range of demons that fell with him when he fell, when uh, Michael and his angels kicked him out of heaven. You would notice that God didn't fight Satan. God doesn't have to fight Satan. Satan is not in God's class. An angel is sufficient to deal with him. You must know that. You must also know that one out of three came with him. One out of three angels uh, followed satan but two out of three stayed with god satan is also hopelessly outnumbered two to one come on why are we afraid of a, an outnumbered devil uh, i know i'm dropping some bombs tonight but you can't be named the boom and not drop bombs and so discerning of spirits has to do with sensing activity in the spirit realm and to know with insight whether it's the Holy Spirit, whether it's a demon spirit, whether it's the spirit of man in operation. And then when you, when you do have revelation on, on the discerning of spirits, the questions you must ask yourself is, A, how does it fit into the word of God? What scriptural references do I have? And sometimes there is none. Don't lose the flow. Keep the flow. How do I apply it in this circumstance that I'm faced with now? Does God want me to say something or is there a check in my spirit that says, just keep it to yourself? Sometimes God gives us revelation to teach us self-control. Because some people run at the mouth all the time. Everything they see, they have to tell. You don't have to tell everything you see. He's not showing you so you can tell the world. Sometimes he's showing you to tell you. So that you can know that you are in touch with him for whatever reason. And sometimes it's to work on your self-control because you have diarrhea of the mouth and he's trying to train you to learn to shut your mouth. So he gives you a bit of information to see if you can handle it. You must discern that. <laughs> Your talkative spirit. Now understand that when you recognize the demonic realm, the demonic world, they are going to react. The man at Gadarenes reacted to Jesus and said, why have you come to torment us before the time? We know who you are. That's what they said to Jesus. We know who you are. The demonic realm knows who you are. The sons of Sceva found that out. And they will react violently. It threw the man in the fire in an attempt to destroy him before Jesus could cast them out of the guy. And then they asked, have you come to torment us before the time? They know judgment is going to come on them. Demons believe the scripture. The Bible says devils believe and tremble. All right, so when you recognize them, know that they will react. You don't know what reaction you will get when you have discerned a spirit. And that's why it's good to have somebody else with you and not to try to be superman or superwoman because they can attack. When Paul discerned that girl with a spirit of divination, the men who were making profit off of her gift, they had him thrown in jail. They had him beaten. Oh yes. There's going to be a reaction. Understand that the devil will attack you. He's a warrior. He's a fighter. And so look for a fight. Understand that the demonic world can follow you. They followed Paul. Shouting what we would think was promotion. These are the servants of the Most High God who have come to show us the way of salvation. But it was a different spirit. This girl was saying the right thing, but making profit for her masters. She had masters on earth. She had earthly masters. Now you know the scripture is right. You cannot serve two masters. Either you love one and hate the other. Now this was not general discernment. 
This was discerning of spirits. It is limited to the range of spirits. The gift of discerning of spirits is limited to the range of spirits. You can't go wrong, I discern this is not gold. I think this is, you know, soaking gold water. That's not what the gift is about. It's about spirits. Now you're discerning everything. This lock was not made with that. This is a fake door. That you're discerning grass, you're discerning dog. You need to stop that thing. Everywhere you turn, you're seeing demons. Those are just the religious people. You get away from them. They're fanatics. And they're not following Jesus Christ. They're following another spirit. That's why they went off into that fanatical zone. All right. The gift of, the, of discerning of spirits is available and vital for profitability. Number one, it's available. Number two, it is vital for profitability. Question you must ask yourself. Not just how does it fit into the scripture and how do I apply it in my circumstance. But question number three is, what is God saying in this that I just picked up? Number four, the questions you must ask yourself. What is God doing in this situation? <clears throat> That's the God question. Now it's the Satan question. Question number five, what is Satan doing? What is he trying to accomplish through this individual? And question number six, what kind of a spirit is this? You know it's from Satan, but you can hone in now and sharpen your radar to pick up what type of spirit it actually is. At points you read in scripture, this man was bound by a spirit of infirmity. Huh? Paul and Silas at the gate, beautiful. Peter and John, sorry. They perceived that the man had faith to be healed. They picked up in their spirit that this man was ready to jump up, even though it would take a miracle for his ankles to get strength. He was ready for a command of faith to leap off his foot and take off running. And he did. But they had to discern the moment. You know how many moments, healing moments and the healing anointing is available. And we shut it down because of fear. We shut it down because of ignorance. We shut it down because the pastor has told us the church finished now and we got to get, we got to wrap things up. We are usually in a hurry. When it comes to God, other things we can do it all night. In Ephesians 6 and 12, the scripture talks about spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. You can't fight what you can't see, but discerning a spirit will give you insight into the unseen realm. You have an enemy who is invisible. You can't fight what you can't see. But with discerning of spirits, you can get insight and see into the realm of the spirit. Now what should you do at this point with all this information that I'm giving you? Because the word of God is never for entertainment. It is always for application. Now this is where the, there's a difference in ministry. I don't preach to get an amen. I preach for the people to apply what they have heard. And the next time I see them... I'm looking to see the application of the last teaching that they receive. I don't care for shouts. I'm looking for change in the people's life. The word of God is not for entertainment, but for application. I would prefer to teach as opposed to hoop and holler, because in our black culture in particular, we like the hooping and hollering, and we are usually broke, full of drama, and just a lot of ignorance in the church. Because all of the above mentioned misbehavior it's the black church that's doing it. Ten thousand people following a man, and they don't have enough scripture. They don't have enough biblical knowledge to know the man is a shyster. Number one, ask and believe that you can receive this gift. First Corinthians fourteen and twelve and onward. Read the entire First Corinthians fourteen. Ask and believe that you must receive it. Now, in the first case, the scripture says earnestly desire spiritual gifts because it is God who gives the desire and then it is God who grants the desires of your heart but if there's no desire there will be no granting of the gift and then you cannot desire what you don't know about how shall they hear without a preacher so if you're walking in ignorance you can't know about these gifts to desire them you don't desire what you don't know if you didn't see that purse on on the ad you wouldn't long for it if you didn't see that cologne on the ad in the ad in the ad they always make you feel like if you don't have this product you're way behind in the dark ages and you go and buy things you don't like and you don't know from people you don't know and you enrich them because of the ad that you saw if the eye didn't see it the heart wouldn't long for it 
I know see heart not bond. That's how we say it back in the, in our colloquial vernacular. I know see heart not bond. If the eyes didn't see it, you wouldn't long for it. Yes. Ask and believe that you can receive this great gift. Desire it, then ask and believe that you can receive this great gift. In Mark 11, 24, thank God for it in advance. By faith, I have received the gift of discerning of spirits by the grace of the living God. Now listen to me carefully. Here is where it's going to take some action on your part too. Be a part of those who believe in it. Oh, Rev, you know, I know what you're saying is true, but my church doesn't believe it, and my pastor doesn't believe it, and my granny and them used to go to this church, and I can't leave my church. In the first place, you don't have a church. There's no such a thing as my church. There's only one church. And Jesus is Lord of that church, and his word is the textbook that we all use. And if you're not believing the textbook, you're not believing the spirit that wrote the book, because he is the one, holy men speak as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And if you don't believe what the Spirit uh, wrote through men, you can't get his gift. You don't believe in him in the first place. Why should he gift you and you don't believe in him? Some people's organization and denomination is more important than their walk with God. They will not leave that church. They will not leave that pastor. Oh, I love my man of God, you know. And, you know, pastor, he doesn't know these things. You know how many people go to other churches and when they have demonic problems, they come to me? They call. They don't want to come to church. They don't want nobody to be seen going to that guy, believe all this spooky stuff. But they call for deliverance and they want their deliverance. I must go to their house and do it. I don't do it no more. You want to be free? Find a church that believes in this stuff and go there. You have a pastor? Let him help you. You can't give him all your benefits and give me all the hard work. I could hear a rat licking ice right now. All right. Be a part of those who believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And if your church does not believe, your minister does not believe the Bible, then you need to leave that church. You need to get out. Bring up the question to them. Show the scripture that I have given. And if they still insist that we don't believe this mess, this guy is a fool, you talk to God about it, and start to align yourself with a church that believes the Bible rightly divided. It's time for mass exodus from some of these dead houses that y'all keep going year in, year out, pouring money into things that are dead. Shame on you. You're more afraid of what a man who doesn't believe God's word says than you are about the God who gave you the word to believe. All right. James 4 and 2. Learn to quiet your flesh so that the spirit man can hear. Be still and know. Yeah? And then be quick to pray and slow to act like a know-it-all. Be quick to pray over the thing that you think you have discerned and be slow to act on it, particularly when you are not the senior pastor of the church. Stop telling the pastor all the things that the Lord revealed to you because you are making him feel like he is not spiritual like you. And sometimes that's the aim that you're doing. You're always seeing into the realms of the spirit and telling the pastor what you saw and you're insisting that he must follow your lead. Well, if he follows your lead, that makes you the leader. Like I said before, God did not show you that thing so that you can go on CNN. Some of it is so that you can learn to control your prattling. Be slow to act like you know it all. Get clarity. Pray over it. Be slow to act. Get clarity. Find the scripture. See whether these things are so that you think you saw. Hebrews 5, 14, 1 Corinthians 14 and 1. And then ask God to give you the ability to see this thing, the thing that you saw and how you should deal with it from his viewpoint. Show it to me from your viewpoint. And God always operates from a viewpoint of love. These gifts work by love. These gifts operate by love. Love is the engine. Love is the gas. Love is the ignition. If you're just doing it so that you can look good, so that you can pass out your card, so that you can look important, in today's church, you have the sense that people are advertising themselves and not advertising God. They're not advertising the Lord. They're advertising themselves. They're advertising their ministry. 
They are advertising their own little kingdom that they are trying to build off the backs of the people and using Jesus' name to build their own reputation. There I said it. These gifts operate by love, so pray to get God's viewpoint on how things should happen. Hello. All right. Let's have another song. A lot of information tonight because I was off for over a week and so I'm making up for lost time so we already had two teachings for the night two sets of teachings and then one final one and then I'll get out of your way or you can you can pretty much tune me out if you want to that's all right I'll be sorry for your loss though <laughs> that part gets people real angry what do you mean it's sorry for my loss I was created to worship you was created to give you all the glory. I'm just going to play one the verse. Rock will take my place. I will praise your name. I was created to worship you. Created to worship. Created to praise Created to bow down, created to wait, created to worship you, created to praise, created to bow down, created to wait. Oh. Created to praise, created to bow down, created to worship you. Gift of discerning of spirits. Now listen carefully. You don't need the gifts to keep you saved. You don't need a gift of discerning of spirit to get saved or to stay saved. But without it, without the gifts of the spirit, there is no power. And when you set up a signboard that advertises church, what you're saying... That this building is dedicated to have an encounter with God. And what you have when you go to church is very little encounter with God. Just a lot of entertainment and all that stuff. And these dance groups need to watch the way the girls are dressing now. I saw one dance today. I just, I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. The underwear is showing. What's up with that? Come on, y'all. Get that mess off from the pulpit. That pastor should be sanctioned and give him a three-month leave of absence from the church. What are we doing poor next? Clean that mess up. You choreographers and dance group people, make sure that when the people are going out there, that they are not going to be enticing the men in the audience. Men are visual. I don't care how anointed he is. Men are visual. You show them all of that flesh, they're going to start feeling sexy and feeling lustful. You're not there to attract flesh nor create lust in the house. You're there to promote some godly type of something for God's sake. Clean that mess up. All right, enough on that. You don't have to have the gift to be saved, but without the gift, there's no power. And there's a lot of powerless houses of God, powerless places that is right now infested with people who are possessed by all kinds of demonic works. And there is no deliverance for them because not even the preacher knows his right hand from his left hand. You have to discover that these gifts exist. 1 Corinthians 12. Discovery leads to recovery. After you have discovered it, now you can use it. Effectiveness is possible with regular use of the gift. You have your senses exercised, said scripture, by reason of use. Desire spiritual gifts. Honestly desire spiritual gifts. 
Paul told the church, earnestly desire spiritual gifts. Not just desire, earnestly, with a hunger. Most people are not hungry. Once that service passed, two hours, they're ready to go home. And they start to itch and scratch and they're ready. They don't care about an encounter with God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 to 10, the gifts, according to that reading, leads to profitability. Profitability to prosper things that pertain to the kingdom of God. And they are given to every believer. So if you're a believer, you're supposed to have a spiritual gift, a spiritual gift or spiritual gifts operating through you. Are you a believer? What are your spiritual gifts? Well, I don't have any. Why not? Are you making God a liar? God said he has given to every man who's a born-again believer. If you're a born-again believer, you have gifts on you. Your job is to be hungry, to locate, and then to begin to use and hone your skills in that particular gift that's operating through you. Gifts are manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Gifts are foundational to the flow and operation of God amongst people. Foundation. You don't have a building without foundation. Gifts are a starting point. A man's gift does not prove how mature he is in Christ. All it proves is that he is a baby in Christ and has just started out. Now, nine are mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, but there are more than nine. That nine gift that is there, there is not a conclusive list of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. All right. Now, the gifts are categorized in three they are vocal gifts, they are revelation gifts, and they are power gifts. That's in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The vocal gifts are prophecy, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. Word, you got to speak. The gifts of revelation are wisdom, knowledge, and discerning a spirit. Revelation, revealing things that you're not supposed to know. You're not supposed to have insight into, but you know that you know. You don't know how you know, but you know. And then there are power gifts. These are gifts that bring demonstration. Healing, gifts of healing, faith, and miracles. These are power gifts. So you have power gifts, you have revelation gifts, and you have vocal gifts. You're supposed to operate in one of the three or in one gift in all three, or, or sometimes God can give you operation in all three, etc. You hear people say, I have all nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. No, you don't. What you have is pride. That's why you can make such a boast. So glibly, a person who is really walking with God, one of the first signs of a person close to God is humility because you become like the thing you worship and spend time with. And God is not arrogant. All right. Discerning of spirits is not discernment. I will pong that a million times because I hear people making mistakes with it all the time. And when you look at them funny, they look at you funny like, I dare you to challenge me now. <laughs> And sometimes it's worth it to challenge them, to call their bluff, because you know that they're open to teaching. Other people, you know they're going to bite your head off. So unless you're feeling feisty that day, and sometimes you do feel like throwing a blow, you just let them know, and then they start a fight, and you fight right back, and you back them up with Scripture, and then when they can't back up with Scripture anymore, they start to speak in tongues and walk away. <laughs> oh, Lord, have mercy. All right. Discernment is a human ability. But discerning of spirits has nothing to do with hunch. It has nothing to do with woman's intuition or any kind of intuition. Are you feeling a brother? It has to do with an ability to distinguish, detect uh, God, devil, or man. It helps to detect the source or the motivating factor behind what people do, why people do what they do. The discerning of spirits is God's diagnostic ability in action. He's diagnosing with precision what's going on here. If you can't know the difference, you'll end up in chaotic circumstances. But you can know the difference, and that, that you can know because the gift of discerning of spirits will help you to discern and to know what is in, what is in operation in your space and time. The Word, the Word of God, the Bible, is the premise for discerning of spirits. Not your gut feeling. Uh -huh, I said that before, not intuition, but the content of the word. You've got to find the, the place where it is written. You have got to know that what you're doing and what you're sensing is biblical. Are you feeling it, brother? In today's church where people really read the scriptures, really read the word of God, I'm not surprised that people get into all kinds of trouble. Simon was, uh, uh, Samuel sorry, was one of the 
greatest prophets of the Old Testament, Dan to Beersheba, an extended piece of property, real estate, from hundreds of miles it covered. His words never fell to the ground. And this accurate prophet, on, in one day he was unable to discern who the king would be. He called Eliab and seven other brothers before he got it right. David was the one to be king. He went to the right house. He got the right father. He got the right brothers. But he picked the wrong one seven times. He had to ask, don't you have another son? And so sometimes you can miss it. And that's why I'm saying the more scripture you know, the better is your basis for discernment. In Matthew 16 and 20, Jesus told them, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. It's not from flesh, you know, people, oh, my grandmother had that ability. That was your grandmother's ability. It's not yours. This thing is not handed down to family. It's, it's given by the Holy Spirit. Unless your grandmother is the Holy Spirit and you know she's not. <laughs> when you say it like that, it gets offensive to people. All right. Your flesh can give messages. Your flesh can try to inform you. How do you know that? Look at what Jesus said here. Flesh and blood did not reveal that to you. So it's always the case that your flesh and your blood wants to give you information and insight. Your blood relatives always want to tell you how things run. Your flesh wants to tell you how things are. Or some human wants to tell you what they think it is. You know how many times I've gone in situations. Let me tell you this one case. I was preaching at this church and I stood in front of a, a particular pew, one of these benches that have seven, eight people in them. And when I stood in front of the pew as I was preaching, the lady in there in the pew said to me through her lips, she didn't say it out loud, you're lying. Meaning that I was preaching about the blood of Jesus and she was getting all riled up about it. You are lying. I could read her lips. And then I said, as I continued the sermon, nobody knew what I was doing. I said, this is not a lie. The blood of Jesus is the agent of purification. One wash from the blood of Jesus. It doesn't matter how long the stain has been on your life. Oh, there is cleansing power in the blood. And she said again, you lie. And I said, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunged beneath that. And the, the church started to, you know, get excited, whatever, whatever. And when the service was done, one of the women had noticed that uh, I would get agitated when I came to that particular row. Because the first time when she said it, I was shocked that somebody would tell me the blood of Jesus is a lie. And they are in the church. And so the, the woman came to me and said, uh, what happened in the, in the pew? And she called the woman's name. I said, no, I don't know who you're talking about. She pointed her out. He said, was she giving you trouble? I said, no, she wasn't giving me trouble. She's just calling me a liar as I was preaching about the blood of Jesus. And she said, maybe you misread her. Um, she's one of our best singers. She's there up there in the choir. She's one of the best deaconess in the church. And I said to her, that woman is a witch. My spirit got angry when she... She's telling me this woman is a deaconess. I said, no, she's a witch. And she, you know, got back to Rev. She called someone else and, and telling me about this deaconess. And she's in the choir and she does good for the church. And ray, 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 ray. And I stood my ground. I said, no, uh, barring all that you have just said, with all due respect to your high opinion of her, that woman is a witch. The next night, she's back there in her seat. And this time, I took it to another level. When I felt the anointing like fire in my feet, in my bones, and I couldn't contain it anymore, I walked up to her and I put my hands on her shoulder and I said, in the name of Jesus, the blood prevails. And she fell from the pew, under the pew. And she started to snake, move like a cobra under the pews, crawling all over the place in a snake-like position. People started leaping on the pew, screaming. To, it was pandemonium in that church. And, and I spoke to the one who was telling me what a great deaconess she was. And I said, there goes the witch. And she had her hand to her mouth. She was shocked out of her socks. A witch in the choir. But they couldn't figure it out. They didn't discern it. And I would not have known either had she not said the blood of Jesus is a lie. Had I listened to flesh and blood them telling me what a great deaconess she was and what a great singer she was in the choir, 
Flesh and blood is always trying to give you information, always trying to give you revelation. Matthew 16 and 20, Jesus said, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you. So flesh and blood always wants to bring revelation. Don't take people's opinion about other people. Whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, get to know them for yourself. That's the point I'm making here. Because the flesh can give information, the flesh can try to inform you. Peter rebuked Jesus one time, you're not going to any cross. And Jesus turned around and rebuked Satan. Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. And he was talking to Peter. One minute Peter had revelation, the next minute Peter was used by Satan. Satan was the driving force behind what Peter was saying. And Jesus did not fight Peter, he fought the demon speaking through Peter. One minute of revelation, next minute Satan is speaking. Are you feeling it, brother, now? Satan loves to speak through people. And Jesus measured what he said by the will and the word of God because Peter had to go, Jesus had to go to the cross, and Peter was trying to prevent him from doing that. One gift, one spirit, sorry, different operation. When Paul cast that devil out, that gift created ruckus in an, in an entire city. A whole city was attracted to the power of the gospel. Accuracy is not always from God. Accuracy is not always from God. This is where you need discerning of spirits. These are the servants of the Most High God. Accurate. They were servants. They were from God. She's two out of two. They have come to show us the way of salvation. Three out of three. She got it all right. She was accurate. But was she from God? No. She had a spirit of divination. It is possible for people to be accurate and for the thing that they are telling you is prompted by a demonic spirit. Accuracy does not mean it's God. Now, this is where the real mature discerning of spirits must come into play because demons and demonic people will come and tell you truth, 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 truth. And if you don't know shibboleth, you will coin a shibboleth. Accuracy does not mean God is moving. A preacher telling the truth does not mean God is using him. There's no weapon that is more deceptive than truth. And so, you have to consider the source behind what is moving that person. The source. What's driving them to do that? What's driving them to say that? She was driven by a demon spirit. These are the servants of the Most High God. And Paul got grieved in the spirit and cast the demons out of that girl. Her truth aggravated Paul. Alarm bells were going on off in his mind. Biblical vexation was gripping him. There is such a thing as holy anger. Oh my God, I've felt it a lot of times. Holy anger. I'd hear a man up there preaching, and he's preaching gospel. I can't find one fault with his preaching. I can't find one fault with his teaching. I can't find one fault with his singing. I can't find one fault with his taking up the offering. I can't find one fault with his suit. I can't find one fault with his choir. I can't find one fault. And yet, the more he ministers, the angrier I get. He said, well, Rev, you must be the one with the demon. Well, let him cast it out of me then. But I'm telling you, there are times when, even though the preacher, whoever he or she is, is telling truth and preaching, uh, cracking lightning and cracking thunder, the witness in your spirit is saying to you, I did not send them. That is not my servant. That's Satan's apostle. And the angrier you get, the angrier you get, biblical vexation gets a hold of you. You feel that lead in your stomach feeling. You get angrier and angrier as that person is preaching. There are places I've gone, listened to ministry, and I feel like somebody is vomiting on me. Coming from the minister. You've got to know. And there are other places I've gone, they say, oh no, oh, this person isn't ready yet. They don't have the, the complexion to make the connection. They, they just wet around, the, you know, their mother's milk is still on their lips. And, and that person goes up there and tears the house to pieces with pure, unadulterated anointing. And I'm wondering, how could they say this one is ragged? And here this person is, is obviously kingdom power that's in demonstration here. You've got to know, don't let people fool you. Know your scripture. Come on, y'all been going to church too long. 
You have people coming to your church putting up a, a, a toilet bowl up there. You can't figure out that's that's not God. You call them prophet. You don't need me to tell you that. Don't rebuke the person, drive out the devil. Paul didn't rebuke the girl, he drove the devils out of her because she was there to conform his ministry, but he spoke to her devil. She seemed right but was wrong. This is where discerning of spirits comes in. It is not between right and wrong, it is between right and almost right. Counterfeit currency is created to look like the real thing. It's never created to look different. Counterfeit ministry is like that. It looks like the real thing. These men that are coming up with names and addresses and and da 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 da, a lot of them are getting it from the familiar spirit because they have been to the native doctor to get powers. I was there in the service when the the, the minister was crying out. He had two thousand pastors working with him, and he said a lot of them are going to the native doctor to get their power so that they'll give them a demonic spirit that will go with them gather information and when he comes to the service the minister who's preaching will tell them what he's seeing and hearing and it's the demon giving him information and they go bring more people and the more people they attract the more spirits are sent to the by the native doctor to this man because everything that's done is attracting souls to the kingdom of darkness and the the, the reverend who was over these men he was in tears because of the counterfeit miracles that were happening they take the sickness off of you and put it on someone else. Satan is not a healer, but he can transfer sickness. Or he takes this headache from off of you and he gives you swelling of the feet. The headache is gone, so you, you, you give a testimony. Tomorrow your foot is swollen. You want to know what happened? Satan never heals, but he's a counterfeiter and he's a replacer. He can take off from you, put it on someone else, and give you something else. You always get something else. You're never left free. Satan is not an agent of freedom. He's an agent of bondage. And if you've been to the fetish house, if you've been to the voodoo house, if you've been to the obia house, if you've been there once, you need deliverance. There is something hiding in you, hiding on you. And the tragedy is it's going to come on your children because whatever you make deals with, with the devil, everything that comes out of you has made that deal too. And it becomes a generational thing. Don't rebuke the person, rebuke the devil. Don't follow your heart. You know, pastor, I have to follow my heart. I have to follow my passion. Uh, where did people get this stuff from? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Above all things, your heart, my heart, is deceitful and desperately wicked. So don't follow your heart. Follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Your gift can save you. That gift of discerning a spirit can save you from a lot of catastrophe. And so, finally, discern the source to protect the outcome. God will allow you to discern the source to protect the outcome because you can see what God sees. And God sees why he made that person. And understand that this treasure is in earthen vessels. And you've got to know what you're worth and you've got to know what they are worth. God shows you, gives you revelation to protect the outcome, to protect next year. To protect five years down the road. He's giving you that ability now, giving you that insight now, giving you that information now. Helping you to discern what that person is doing so you can help them to be free because he has a five-year plan in 2024. This person is going to shake a continent. The same person you dislike and despise. Oh, I can't take her. I can't stand her. I can't stand him. He just annoys me. I don't like that reverend. Oh, Essibum, I don't like him at all. He's too blunt. He just he like he thinks he knows everything. I don't know everything, but I know some things, and I'll tell you what I know. All right. It is imperative in this day and time. It is crucial in this day and time that you be empowered by the gift of discerning of spirits so that as you move out in the world and in the church world, which is even more dangerous, you're able to know what you're dealing with. You have insight into what is. And you don't have to be conned. You don't have to be hoodwinked. You don't have to be misled by a shyster. Because God has been good to you and gives you the ability to know what it is that you are dealing with. All right.
tomorrow night at 8 again. We're going to talk some more about discerning of spirits. God bless you. Pray about these matters and read the scripture that you are given. Don't say I said. Say I read it in the word. Have a good night, everybody. God bless. The boom is out.